Recently, our client John met his banker to discuss plans for a clean energy building. What he found was a shared passion for building something more, momentum for change. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John. Tonight in Arkansas, there's a mother tucking in her daughter and turning off the light. A business owner is burning the midnight oil. An at-home dinner date is plating up possibility. And it's all happening under one roof. How? The power of a conversation. Like the one John from Integrity Solutions had with First Horizon Bank about his vision for a sustainable mixed-use building. Now it's not just words, it's life. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Hello there. Thanks for joining us. This is Space Nuts, where we talk astronomy and space science every week. And my name's Andrew Dunkley. I'm your host. And coming up on this episode, we're going to look at a new telescope, which has just been launched or officially opened by his good self, Professor Fred Watson. We'll tell you all about that. There's another hole in the James Webb Space Telescope. Well, let's call it a dent. It's not a hole. But it's a it's a you know it's a dent, and uh, they found some string on Mars. Is it Martian string, or did it get there some other way? And somebody wants to get up close and personal with near Earth objects. That their game. We'll also be answering audience questions about New Horizons and is there a better place to live than the Sun? Well, not on it, but around it. Apparently, there might be. We'll get into all of that on this episode of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining me as he tends to do every week because <laughs> he's got nothing better to do, <laughs> really is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, one day I'll find a proper job or something like that. One day, yeah. one day. You know, sure. No rush. No rush on these really things. No. Hey, I, yeah, I went to Canberra last weekend. Ooh. Uh, this, this is a lesson to everybody. Do your homework before you plan a visit to a place like Canberra because they might be renovating something that you wanted to go and see. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. What was it? The Australian War Memorial. Oh, really? Okay. One yeah. of my favourite places in the world. I, yeah. I adore the place. Haven't mm. been there for so very long, and we thought, gosh, we're retired now. Let's do a road trip and drive five hours to go and see the Australian War Memorial, only to find out that um, it's renovated, so it's a bit more of a low-key opportunity situation. Not all the exhibits are um, actually open, and they've got it sort of set up for very limited exposure. And so you get to spend two hours there. Two hours mm. is all we got. But it was still very, very enjoyable and enlightening. And uh, it's very, very different. Lots of new things that I hadn't seen before. So that was great. But yeah, got to go back now. But Of course you do, yeah. yeah. Is, um, is G for George still no. on exhibition? He's, we, no, oh, he's okay. off exhibition. And for those who oh. don't know what Fred's talking about, G for George is a Lancaster bomber from World War II. Beautiful, beautiful aircraft. I love G for George, but no, I couldn't see him. Saw a Spitfire, saw a Mustang, saw a Zero, saw a few other planes. I went through the, I spent most of my time in the World War I part of the, the War Memorial because, would, yeah. well, my More historical interest really. in it with my grandfather and his <laughs> brothers fighting in the First World War. And, and that quite amazing and I know I'm, I'm really happy they've still got the dioramas there that rather than photos or pictures or whatever of uh, the major battles of World War One, they did them up in dioramas and they look amazing so just it's like you're looking at the thing as it happened and uh, the the one at uh, Mont Saint Quentin where um, the second division had that great victory and pushed the Germans all the way back to the Hindenburg line is still is still on the exhibit and my grandfather was right in the middle of that battle so I'm uh, glad to see it was still there. So, yeah. He might be in the diorama. Yeah, well, might, well, who knows? Well, there is a Lewis gun crew in the diorama, <laughs> and he was on a Lewis gun crew. Yeah, all right. So, that's what he did. Yeah, yeah. Could have been him. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So, that's what I've been up to. And, Fred, you had a busy time of it, too. Last week, that's right, in, in Siding Spring Observatory, where the, well, the National Optical Astronomy Observatory is, including the largest telescope in Australia, or the largest visible light telescope in Australia, the Anglo-Australian Telescope. We might say a bit more about that yeah, in a minute. Yeah, why not? Well, let's let's start yeah. now, because there's been some, there's some, <laughs> been some happenings at Coonabarabran. Yeah, that's right. So 
the reason why I was there last week was to do the honours in opening a new telescope there, which is a very unusual one and one that I think is quite exciting for various reasons, most notably, and I guess, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the thing that singles it out from most other professional astronomical telescopes of any size. This one was made from shelf components. So <clears throat> things you can, excuse me, <clears throat> you can't exactly go into your local astronomy shop and buy them, sorry, ph photographic shop and buy them, but you can, if you talk to the company that makes them, and I might as well mention their name, it's Canon, they, these are lenses that are off the shelf. They're lenses that are normally used for wildlife and sports photography. So they're fast lenses, f2.8. That will mean something, I'm sure, to many of our listeners. And they 400 millimeter focal length. So that they're big optics. They're, you know, the diameter is like five inches or thereabouts of the lens. And that, um, that length, 400 millimeters, is actually not quite that long the the unit because it's you know it's all optics things of that sort but it is they're very very sizable lenses and exceedingly good quality but so let me let me finish the story there are 10 of these lenses in the telescope whose name I should tell you which is Huntsman and you will know Huntsman as an yep. Australian spider it seems to be fashionable among builders of instruments for astronomy in Australia these days to give them names from Australian wildlife. I've been involved with uh, the Funnelweb project and the Taipan project and the Echidna project, <laughs> but not Emu or Wallaby, which are actually radio right. astronomy projects. So uh, Huntsman, and of course, the other reason why it's called Huntsman is, do you know how many eyes Huntsman have? I'm going to say 10. I think it's eight, actually, oh, okay. but you could be right. They've got more than one. That's the thing, yeah. more than two. And that's, of course, the link, because it looks like um, looks a bit like a, a spider with all these eyes. So that's how the thing is set up, and it's on a high-end, very high-end telescope mounting to make sure it tracks the sky supremely. But what makes these lenses particularly suitable for this work is the coatings on them. So you probably know that lenses have, we used to call anti-reflection coatings, which basically means that you don't get light reflecting off the light lens surface as well as going through. If you don't have, if you have a, a glass surface that's got no coating on it, about, if I remember rightly, about five, six percent of it is reflected back the way it came. Yeah. And the other 94 and 95 goes through into the lens. And if you've got a lens with 20 optical surfaces and you don't put coatings on, by the time you get to it, you've just got this dribble of light coming out by the time you get to the end, the image plane. So optical coatings have been applied actually since the Second World War. And in fact, since the 1980s, probably, what are called multi-layer coatings have been applied, which actually reduce further the amount of reflection coming back. But these lenses have got a nanostructure coating on them. So these tiny little dimples, I suppose you'd call them, or not indentations, they come outwards, I think, rather than inwards, little protuberances, which are smaller than the wavelength of light. And these nanomaterials can actually make a huge difference to how much light is reflected back. Uh, so your, your coating process becomes not so much putting a, a thin layer of some of the material on, which is what normal coatings do. But these nano structures on, which essentially gets rid of the reflections altogether. Why is that important? Mm. Not just because you're losing light. It's because reflections inside lenses, basically that means light's bouncing around in there and it finds its way into the image where you don't want it. Stuff that should, you know, it's just bounced out around between the lenses. And that is what makes the images provided by these lenses incredibly clean, very, very free from any sort of reflected, what we call ghost images, actually, within the, within the lenses. So they're, they're very clean, and that lends them to their purpose, which I knew I'd get to eventually. I think I'm nearing it at the moment. There's a number of things that you can do with them, but one of them, and one of the main reasons, and this is what drove the principal investigator, Dr. Lee Spittler, um, who's 
really the, the genius behind this and who sadly missed the opening because he went down with COVID, he, he foresaw the benefit in this really clean imagery for products where you're looking for very, very faint light between galaxies uh, because that is not totally swamped by scattering within the telescope. You know, a more conventional telescope with just a big mirror or something would have scattering that would swamp out that very faint light that you're trying to find. Why is that faint light there? Because it tells you about collisions. If you've got two galaxies that collide or another smaller galaxy passes through a, a larger one, you get debris thrown off in the shape of stars. But these things are so far away that those stars just merge into a very, very faint background layer of light. If you can track where that light is, you can get some insight into the physics of these collisions, how they've happened. And in particular, what might happen when our galaxy runs into Andromeda in uh, three and a half yeah. billion years or thereabouts. So it's all about studying these deep phenomena in space in a way that you can't do any other way. So got to take your hat off to Lee and his team. And, and I should mention Sarah Kennedy and her colleagues who uh, is a PhD student and her colleagues are PhD students at Macquarie University, which is the institution responsible for this, with whom I have an honorary position. I have to, wow. <laughs> just throw it in. And an, and an honorary doctorate as well. They gave me that a couple of months ago. So I'm saying all the right things about Macquarie, but it is it's a fantastic project. I was delighted to be able to come and help to open it. Really very happy about the way the thing's going. I think they're going to see really great data. There will be a lot of really new information about colliding mm. galaxies that comes from it. And the yeah. best thing is, Andrew, because it's a modular construction, you can add to it. So, you know, if they manage to save up a few more dollars to buy some more of these lenses, then you can essentially improve the size of the telescope. Yeah. You make it bigger, make it 20 lenses perhaps. It's a very impressive looking device, I must say. Yeah. And yeah, it, do it does look like the array of set of eyes from a spider, yes, the way it's it set up. It right. really does have that look yeah. about it. This, this, this cluster of eyes peering at you and thinking, oh, I'd like to eat that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that might be what it's thinking when it looks at the galaxy. Yeah, maybe. I might, yeah. I might just throw in one more credit that I sure. mentioned, and that is that the idea was inspired by a teles telescope which uses the same lenses and a similar configuration, but it's in the northern hemisphere. In fact, uh, it's called Dragonfly. I think it's in New Mexico, if I remember rightly, and that's where it operates. And so now we've got this both northern and hemisphere coverage with these quite unique telescopes certainly huntsman is the first one in the southern hemisphere fantastic well done to everybody yeah i think so too. good on them all and uh, apparently after fred finished his speech everybody had gone home to bed <laughs> now let's move on to our favorite how did you know that how did you know that <laughs> <laughs> because you, you only talk in really short bursts fred that's that's how i know <laughs> that. yeah now let's move on to uh, our favorite subject at this time that's the James Webb Space Telescope, which has got another dent in it. It has, yes. There's a another micrometeorite. Sorry, let's get it right. A micrometeoroid. Right. Because meteoroids are what fly through space. Meteorites are what hit the ground. And, yes, a dent, which happened sometime between the 22nd and the 24th of May, but has really only been analysed within the last um, few weeks. And mm. what I love the way they describe this damage significant, uncorrectable change. Yeah. When I first heard that, I thought, gosh, the, the telescope's yeah, doomed. It's all over. It's red all red over. Red. Yeah. Whoa, that didn't last long, did it? But mm. actually, when you read further, <clears throat> excuse me, it is something that's uncorrectable in the sense that no matter how much adjustment you do to the mirrors themselves, and, and that's what you can do, you can actually do quite a lot of adjustment. It's still got a dent in it. So the the good side is that so far, from what I've read, uh, they've got the images themselves show no degradation whatsoever. So there's a dent. It's in the C three mirror. See, I read my stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and there are, should explain that actually. There are three types of mirror, which are called A, B, and C, and they have each group has the same curvature. 
And if you can imagine this array of hexagons, you're going to have some that will be the same distance from the centre, which is what it's really defined by. So the okay. A, B and C types all have different curvature. This is a C3, number three in the C series. And it's got this dent. And they've done adjustments. You don't have to look far on the web to find before and after images, which are the wavefront images that give you an idea of the quality of the error in the mirror. Mm. And you can see there's a, there's a white spot in the C3 mirror. Yeah. Makes you wonder if that's twice now it's been dinged, I think. It's it makes 19 you wonder, times. 19 times. 19 times. So yeah. it does twice sort of, that have been big enough to be reported. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. In the right spot. <laughs> that's what I was trying to get at. If, yeah, if it's yeah. going to get hit so many times in such a short period, what are we going to be talking about in a year? Yeah, that's right. They're all dinged. I think, yeah. I mean, all we hear about this is that modelling that was done beforehand, before the telescope was put there, indicated that this problem would be with intolerance. It would be, mm. you know, nominal, if I can put it that way, <laughs> to have a few impacts. But I think the two of them, I mean, there was that one that knocked the mirror slightly out of adjustment, which they managed to correct okay. And this one, which has been corrected up to a certain level, but but there's still evidence that it's there. That does make you wonder because it's only been in space for six months or so. Yeah. Seven it's, months. Um, copped a bit of a shellacking at this yeah. point. I guess, you know, given where it is, the second Lagrange point, so it's a gravitational null point where you can have stable spacecraft in orbit around this point, and there's a number there. Gaia's there. Gaia, the spacecraft at the star positions. Uh, Planck is there, I think. The, in fact, it may be even WMAP, the, the Wilkinson micro, Microwave and Isotropy Probe. I, get, I forget all these, but there are several spacecraft in that vicinity. So they must know about the dust impact levels. But you would think intuitively that a place where it's gravitational, gravitationally stable would collect dust, inter, interstellar dust. And we know... Some of the other Lagrange points that involve the moon do have dust clouds on them. They've got a name. The 60-degree ones before and after the moon have got, uh, one of them has got a detectable dust cloud there. So mm. they do collect dust, those stable points. And that's yeah. Where they well, let's just hope that it doesn't continue. <laughs> yes. Or they don't get bigger. Bigger, yeah. That's right. Mm. All right. I was going to move on to our next story straight away, but we might take a breath and deal with that after the break. You're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Recently, our client John met his banker to discuss plans for a clean energy building. What he found was a shared passion for building something more. Momentum for change. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John. Okay, we checked all four systems and seeing with a go. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, there's been a story that sort of caught the imagination of a, a lot of people in the news over the last few days, and that is the discovery of a ball of string on Mars. Many saying it's probably Martian spaghetti. Others <laughs> saying, where could it possibly have come from? And, of course, all the tongue-in-cheek stuff has been a lot of fun, but uh, yes. there are theories. There are theories. And like everything we've found on Mars, it shouldn't be there. It's probably been put there by us. Yes, exactly. And possibly, you know, it could be part of the parachutes, so the harness that um, was used to slow down either Perseverance or some other spacecraft. Yeah. Uh, or or there's apparently, uh, I don't know whether you remember the way Perseverance and Curiosity land on Mars is with a, with a crane, a sky crane, right. rather than... The earlier versions, which kind of just bounced them off the surface, protected by a lot of beach balls and that kind of thing. So the sky crane actually supports the spacecraft from above, lowers it onto the surface before the sky crane jettisons the, the cabling and heads off. And so there's that's the speculation that it's either a component, you know, that was used in that in that um, uh, procedure, or a piece of cord from the parachute, or that landing system that lowers the rover to the ground as the spokesperson for NASA. Yes. Note that we don't have confirmation that it's one or the other. Now, was my question is, did it blow into the path of 
perseverance and it just happened to be in the right place at the right time to get the photo or did it fall off perseverance before it blew away because apparently it did didn't stay there very long uh yeah I, that's right so it was found it was spotted by one of the cameras on perseverance and it's a front one so i think it was lying on the ground perseverance was chugging along spotted it stopped said what the something is that and checked it out but then when perseverance came back to that spot apparently four days later it had gone and the suggestion is it was blown away by the wind and when you see the image of it it looks like a tangled bit of string that would not hang around for very long if the wind was blowing it's got it's um, got tumbleweed written all over it it does doesn't it that's exactly right but it, it ain't tumbleweed no. So, you know, the, the overwhelming odds are that it's something that we um, that we took to Mars. Uh, probably NASA took it to Mars, in fact. Mm. Uh, well, it's not the first piece this, of junk that we've um, come across, is it? No, that's right. There's been um, covers and plastic covers and things of that sort. In fact, I think the shell of the aero shell of some of these re-entering spacecraft that have or not re-entering, but entering spacecraft has been found as well. Bits and bits of trash. There was a McDonald's fries um, packet too. <laughs> I didn't see that. I did see the top hat. There was a top hat that somebody gave us in that. Good guy. That was quite some time ago. There's a there's a newspaper in Britain, the Daily Express, that frequently reports on artifacts like this that um, would have been left there. And the top hat was great because they had a picture of this. Rock on Mars, and then a picture of a top hat next to it to show you what it really looked yeah. like, <laughs> and a comment by, I can't remember his name, but he made a comment, he's a UFO specialist, that this was almost certainly left behind by a human who had been abducted. <laughs> almost oh, certainly. Gosh. Almost certainly. It gives me a headache. <laughs> <laughs> popular press. Anyway, uh, that's, that's yeah. The popular press. You've got to yes. sell your newspapers somehow, I suppose. Yeah. yeah it, it is a bit sad, though, too. because we're, we're junking up Mars. Yeah, we are. We're, we're trashing Mars. I'm nowhere near as much as we potentially could do if we went in, in large you know, in large numbers yes. of humans. But yeah. Oh, well. Anyway, it's it's there. Nothing we can do about it at the moment. Maybe when they send the first or second human mission to Mars, they can. They can take a vacuum cleaner with the pick yeah. it up. Pick it up. Now let's move on to the next topic, and this, this one I find fascinating because it focuses on something that we really haven't paid a heck of a lot of attention to. Now we're talking about near Earth objects, but we're talking about the ones that we can't see very well because they're within the orbit of our planet while they orbit the sun, and these ones are a particular type of near-Earth object, but they're also ones to to worry about because they're hitting things from time to time. But the other interesting part of this story, Fred, is that the fact that they're hitting things like the Earth and the Moon and Venus would suggest they should be declining in number, and they're not, <laughs> which means they're coming from somewhere. Yes, that's right. <clears throat> yes, they're coming. That's right. Where are they coming from? This is um, uh, Dr. Scott Shepard, who's oh, actually at the University of Hawaii in, in, in um, Oahu, probably at um, Moana. That's the, the uh, Oahu campus of the University of Hawaii. Anyway, is it with the Institute of Astronomy there? And this is a, it's a kind of um, an op-ed piece that he's written in Science, the journal, suggesting that we have an issue with near-Earth objects mm. that lie in the direction of the sun and it suggests that we should be looking for them. And it's a good point because what you've got is a situation where we have a lot of near-Earth objects that orbit between the Earth and the sun. And so because of where they are, they're difficult to see. Looking, looking directly at the sun is not something we're doing. You could do it with radar and things, of course. And I think we're getting better at observing uh, objects in twilight. Uh, and actually, you know, twilight is when you might see these things, either morning twilight or evening twilight, when the sun's yeah. not very far below the horizon, if you pick them up. And it's interesting that back in February, NASA 
wrote a letter to, I think it was the Federal Communications Commission in the USA, expressing concerns about Starlink Generation 2, which is already approved to, to put 30,000 more Starlink spacecraft into orbit. They were very concerned about the effect that these spacecraft could have on our ability to pick up near-Earth objects in twilight, uh, what if might be called PHAs, potentially hazardous asteroids. Uh, so there's already been a, a worry ex expressed about uh, the idea that Starlink satellites could be, you know, mistaken for uh, for a, a near Earth ob object on a collision course, or vice versa. That you could say, oh no, it's not, it's not going to hit us. It's just a Starlink satellite. He mentions that there are facilities, pretty recent ones, that do actually have the capability to to study. So these, you know, near Earth objects coming from the sun, in, and in fact, he mentions the Zwicky Transient Facility, which is actually um, a telescope very similar to one that we have at Siding Spring, the UK Schmidt Telescope. This is what used to be called the Palomar Schmidt Telescope, and is now a wide-angle telescope equipped with very sensitive detectors looking for things like asteroids or other transient events. One thing that I not mentioned in this, might be mentioned in uh, in Shepard's original article, but I do know that there has been a lot of thought given to and a lot of advocacy for the idea of a spacecraft orbiting between the orbits of Earth and Venus, essentially to look back at the Earth. In fact, what you could do mm. is put it at the L1 point, the balance point gravitationally between the Earth and the Sun, which is about a million and a half kilometres on the Earth side of the of the Sun, the opposite side from, sorry, on the Sun side of the Earth, I beg your pardon, the opposite side from which... Just say it's to the east. <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> it's that way. <laughs> Let's say this it's the opposite side to which the James Webb space telescope is on because that's on the far side on the l2 lagrange point if you put a spacecraft there then it's always looking back at the earth if you give it a wide enough field of view it might very well detect some of these objects because the ones that are passing close to earth of course are being illuminated directly by the sun and you're you've got with this camera you've got your back to the sun so you would see them very brightly illuminated so I think that's a good thing to do. But finally, the uh, yeah, exactly as you've said, there's an issue that uh, the models, the modelling that's been done on these objects that orbit within the orbit of the Earth, uh, the the modelling says yes, their numbers should be dropping, but they're not. So where are they being replenished mm. from? Is somebody supplying that, <laughs> near Earth objects? Some somebody. They're coming yeah, from somewhere. somewhere or something. something yeah. Clearly, I think yes. Yeah. It could so, be the modelling that's uh, I don't know that's got a way to go. Well, that's the other thing. But it's an interesting mm. thing. Could be string. <laughs> could be a bit of string <laughs> left behind all the, by all the string. Uh, dear. Yes, it could be. We seem to lose yeah, that stuff yeah, very it easily. Blows around, and next thing you know, we're taking photographs of it. Yeah. So at this stage, this stage is just hang on, people. Look, we'll consider this, and that's as far as it's got so far. I think that is the case. There, there is certainly there's been. Um, there has been a, a lot of work in terms of exploring the idea of a, of a dedicated spacecraft inside the orbit of the Earth, looking back at the Earth to find such objects. And I think there's been quite a bit of fundraising, but I don't think we're there yet we're building one of these things. Okay. Well, let's hope nothing bangs into us in the meantime. Indeed. Mm. Yeah. All right, we're going to take another little break from Space Nuts. We'll be back with questions shortly. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching if you're watching live while we record or, or watching later on YouTube or listening to your favourite podcast platform. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. PMS, pregnancy, menopause. Each stage of womanhood has its unique challenges. That's why Highlands Natural's new women's multivitamins are formulated with essential daily nutrients, plus targeted support for your life stage. Facing PMS, there's a Highlands Multi for that. Navigating pregnancy and morning sickness, that too. In the throes of menopause, our formula is here to support you through hot flashes and skin changes. Gone are the days of juggling multiple supplements or guessing what you might need. 
With Highlands Naturals, it's one multivitamin with daily essential nutrients and science-backed ingredients to support you. An all-in-one wellness solution to lighten the load for women? Highlands Naturals is here for it. Find your multi at Amazon or Highlands.com. That's H-Y-L-A-N-D-S dot com. Highlands Naturals. We're here for it. Experiences are what people love the most about travel. That's why they love Viator. They have over 300,000 bookable experiences and something for everyone. Plus, their travel experiences have millions of real traveler reviews, so you have the information you need to book the best activities for your trip. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10 for 10% off your first booking in the app. One app, over 300,000 travel experiences you'll remember. Do more with Viator. Roger, your last here also. Space Nuts. Question time, Fred. I've got plenty of questions, but we'll turn it over to the audience because they ask better questions than I do. And Andrew in Vancouver has a real ripper for you. How's it going, guys? Andrew here from Vancouver Island, BC. Uh, this question is about the New Horizons probe. Um, I don't know about you, but I was super interested in the flyby of Pluto, um, especially since we had not very much uh, information or photos of the planet up until that point. Um, I was also really interested in the Arakoth flyby, which was, I believe, two or three years later. Um, so my question for you is, uh, now that it's done those science missions and it's getting farther and farther away, uh, what is the chance that mission planners will be, will be able to locate uh, another object, um, at least for a flyby? Uh, and if unlikely, uh, what other science can the probe do out there? Um, Hopefully it won't go to waste, considering that uh, they're saying it has all of its uh, science equipment up and running. Thanks for your time. Mm, thank you, Andrew. Vancouver Island, my apologies. It's not exactly Vancouver. It's three hours across the water, isn't it? Something like that. Um, I don't know. I'll find out next year. We're going to be there. Yeah, next it's a lovely place, I'm told. I expect a personal guided tour, Andrew. I do. <laughs> uh, now, what about uh, yeah, New, New Horizons getting uh, tasked to look at another project or, or performing some other form of science? Yeah, you know, this is certainly a, a, a real prospect to try and um, essentially try and uh, make use of the fact that New Horizons is still in good shape, as it was after the Pluto flyby. That was very exciting, the fact that mm. in 2015, the Pluto flyby, it was Gosh, um, the has 14th flying. of July, I think it was. 2015, if I remember rightly. Um, yeah. And then in December 2018, Arakos, what we used to call Ultima Thule, looked like a snowman. I don't know if you remember that. It was, yeah, I uh, do. And that very fitting because it was right, I think it was around about Christmas time uh, when the images came back. So, and both of those flybys produced wonderful science, told us so much about certainly Pluto and its family of moons, as well as Arakos. Um, and and the spacecraft continues to be in good shape. So since uh, 2020, the New Horizons research team, which is led by Alan Stern, who's so uh, he's a good bloke. I had a nice chat with him once before the flyby, actually. It was, uh, but it's very nice to meet him. The, that team has been using the Subaru telescope which is an eight metre class telescope, Mauna Kea, mountain top in Hawaii. It's run by the Japanese, as you might expect, Subaru, of course, being the Japanese name for the Seven Sisters or the Pleiades. And what they're doing is essentially looking for another object that could be flown past by New Horizons. The problem here, of course, is that the further New Horizons bores into space, the fainter are the objects that it might want to look at. Yeah. And that's really the the crux. So that's why you need a, an eight-metre class telescope to try and find suitable candidates. The news that I have, I don't have anything recent on this, but certainly as of a year and a half ago or thereabouts, uh, uh, there are none that have turned up that that are within the capabilities of the spacecraft to change its trajectory. Because mm -hmm. whatever you find, you've got to then 
work out a new trajectory so that the spacecraft will pass close to it. And to do that, you've got to burn fuel and you've got a limit as to how much fuel is on board. It's still quite a lot, I think, but but you might, you know, it's not enough to to, to make a burn to some of the objects that perhaps have been found. So that's one issue that is ongoing, and I'm sure they're working pretty hard. They've worked hard to find Arakoth. I can't remember what its its name was before it was, I mean, it was Ultima Thule for a while, but I can't remember what designation it had before before it turned into a formerly Arakoth. But so far, there's no candidates for another flyby. But it, it I bet sounds... that doesn't stop them looking. No, I was going to say, but it sounds to me, Fred, like its initial project was basically all they could really plan for and then the next step. But beyond that, it was sort of wing and a prayer stuff because you can't really see what's going on out there too well, I would imagine. Yes, because it's because these things are so far away. That's, that's correct. Um, so yeah. I think New Horizons is currently... It's incredible. It's 50 astronomical units from uh, from the sun, thereabouts. Remember, Neptune is 30 astronomical units from the sun, so it's already way, way out in the... It's well and truly in the Kuiper belt. Uh, there is other science that can be done. I think we spoke about a very nice measurement that was made some months ago where New Horizons was used to provide... A a, a much longer baseline for looking at the parallax of other stars. I think it um, Proxima Centauri and maybe another star. So that because you're so far from the Earth, and we know the we know the exact position of Proxima Centauri as seen from the Earth. Yeah. If you can measure the position in the sky when you're 40 or 50 astronomical units away, and remember the Earth is one astronomical unit from the Sun, then you've got a much longer baseline to do a parallax me measurement. And I think that was what was done. And that kind of thing might continue because it doesn't really demand much energy and certainly doesn't demand fuel if you're not making any course adjustments. One other thing that's been suggested is looking back to take a photograph of the Earth from the Kuiper belt. But that's dangerous because you've got the sun in the same field of view and these cameras on board New Horizons don't have shutters on them. They're, oh. they're, you know, you'd be looking directly, see the image sensor will be focused directly on the sun and probably burn a hole in it. And and that'll, yeah, they'll burn the film. Yeah. Well, certainly burn the, um, the, the you know, the, the silicon on the detector, that's right. Yeah, that's, yeah. Oh, well, uh, we'll just watch with interest and see what they come up with. Moving forward, yeah, I'm sure they will. Is it going to be? Is it going to be like the void probes, and then just you know, just head up on out forever? Yes, that type of thing. Yeah, it's the fifth spacecraft leaving the solar system after the two voyages and the two pioneers. Wow, it is. It will never come back. Good grief! Yeah, it's an extraordinary mission. I mean, its velocity now is something like fourteen relative to the sun, fourteen kilometers per second. It was much higher than that when it was launched. It's slowing down too because of the it's leaving the gravity potential of the sun. But it is on a, it is an escape trajectory. It will never come back. Yeah. All right, Andrew. Great question. Really good question. And uh, the answer is yes, but we don't know which yes it will be. <laughs> effectively, yes. Uh, let's get a question from the Greater Sydney region, where you hail from, Fred. Mm -hmm. Well, not originally, but at the moment. I do. I initially thought he was just uh, asking a question we've answered many times about the different types of stars out there, but uh, he hones in on something that I think is a really interesting discussion point. This is Neil. Hi, gents. Neil from Sydney here. I'm aware that stars are classified by their spectral types and our sun is a G2V type. Given that life exists at least on Earth, a G2V star is obviously conducive for supporting life. However, life on Earth can be troubled by our sun's UV radiation and other factors. I was wondering whether our sun is the most ideal star for supporting life, or whether there are better stars to focus our search for life on other solar systems. Thanks for an amazing podcast. Thank you, Neil. I have a simple answer for you. Skin cancer. Well, You're spot you on. Go. That's right. The sun sucks. Yeah. Ultraviolet. That's right. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'd um, 
So I'm going to guess that it's, I know we've sort of talked about this before. I'm going to guess that there may be better candidates for us to orbit and live on or around compared to our own sun. Not that we've got a choice in the matter. No, not really. <laughs> I, I might just um, do a disclaimer here because what I'd refer Neil if Neil's interested in this in this issue. There's a fantastic article on that good old standby Wikipedia under the heading Planetary Habit- Habitability. Planetary Habitability and goes into exactly the kind of things that we're talking about. You know, what are the pluses and minuses of living on particular on planets around particular types of stars? And clearly the Earth is one that can support planets. There's it's got certainly got all the requisites in terms of things like water, abundant water, which is the working fluid for life as we know it, Jim. <clears throat> it's got it's got the, the kind of minerals that we we seem to need for life as well and you know, the rare earths and things like that sort. Uh, but there are other classes of star that may have advantages. And just really to pull one out of the air, we know that the most common stars are these dwarf stars. And in fact, red dwarf stars are cool stars, and they are they're the commonest. Some of those are a bit unfortunate because they spurt out a lot of solar flares or stellar flares. But in general, they might offer, those smaller dwarf stars might offer a better shot life-giving organisms because they've got a much longer life themselves. Mm. Uh, so you've got, um, you know, these things last for many billions of years more than the sun will. So, you know, if it, life takes a long time, several billion years to, to get going and to, and to evolve, then your, you know, your um, dwarf stars might actually be, might actually be better because they, they give you more time. There's a, an interesting classification as well that was proposed by an author by the name of Lemmer. I don't know that author's first name because I haven't looked at the reference properly, with a possible classification of water-dependent habitat types. So class one is bodies that don't keep water, and I suppose Mars is, is an example of that, class one. or well, maybe that's a class two. Hang on. Uh, yeah, class class one habitats are planetary bodies on which stellar and geophysical conditions allow liquid water to be available at the surface along with sunlight so that complex multi-celled organisms may originate. Class two habitats start off like that, but don't last like that. that includes yeah. Mars and possibly Venus. Um, and then there's interesting stuff which are called class three habitats, Planetary bodies where liquid water oceans exist below the surface where they can interact directly with a silicate-rich core. That, of course, means places like Enceladus Europe. and Europa. Europa. Yeah, that's right. So there, that'd be a class three. And class four habitats. Oh, this is interesting. Liquid water layers between two ice layers Ooh. or liquids above ice. And they, yes... Wikipedia actually suggests Ganymede and Callisto, two moons of Jupiter, are likely examples of this class. In other words, the oceans are between two ice layers. It's, as they say, in such conditions, the emergence of life forms may be very difficult because the necessary ingredients for life likely be completed, completely diluted. Much is written, this page at least, and probably many others, about the ability habitability of planets well worth a look yeah uh, when it comes to what kinds of stars would be best to uh, to orbit yeah. it sounds like the the dwarf stars are the best prime yes. candidates yeah. and ours ain't yeah so there's no point in looking for life around the sun obviously uh, nothing but to see here nothing to see here but of course um our very nearest star apart from the sun is a dwarf star a proxima centauri right unfortunately it's one that does spurt out these flares, but it is one that's got an Earth-like planet around it, or Earth-sized anyway. Yeah. I don't think it'll be long, Fred, before we find an Earth-sized uh, planet in the Goldilocks zone of another star that has the right parameters. There's got to be planets out there that are like ours, 
about the same size, about the same proximity from their star in in that right environment. There's got to be squillions of them, to be honest. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So far, we've found Earth-like planets that are too big, so gravity would be a yeah, problem. That's right. Yes, other such issues. You know, mm. things things that are too big within the habitable zone, the yeah. Goldilocks zone. Yeah. But I, I I did see an article the other day that. There's a really big search about to begin now. I can't remember who it is. Might have been the Japanese, might be the Russians. Not sure, but they they're going to start a really. Oh, it's the Chinese. They're going to start a really big search for an Earth-sized planet in the Goldilocks zone of a star that will effectively Sunlight give them star. the right yeah. formula. They, they've actually just started that project apparently, or are about to. So okay, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that yeah. if they yeah, ever yeah. tell us what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, great question, Neil, and thank you for uh, for asking it. It's it's always interesting to uh, sort of speculate as to whether or not we're in the in the best possible place, and we're not, as the case may be. No, <laughs> come to the right yeah, place. It's always like that. Oh damn it! Why did we stop here? Anyway, uh, that is where we're going to wrap things up. Don't forget, if you've got questions for us, jump on our website and send them to us. You can text through your question via the email interface on the AMA tab, or you can just send us an audio question. Don't forget to tell us who you are and where you're from, and you can do that on the AMA tab or the send us your audio question tab on the right-hand side, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. And while you're there, visit the Space Nuts shop and check out all the news as it rolls in. It updates very regularly, and don't forget to look at the... uh, potential of becoming a patron and putting a little money in the kitty to keep us alive and kicking so we can buy Fred a new computer. And don't forget, review reviews. We love your reviews. Please keep them coming in on your respective podcast platforms, whether that's iHeartRadio or iTunes or whatever platform you use. Yeah, your reviews are most welcome and uh, we appreciate them as well. Don't forget social media. We're all over that. Fred, thank you so much. It's been a joy to catch up with you again. We'll we'll see you next week. Sounds great, Andrew, and thank you very much, and we'll talk soon. Very good. Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, part of the team here at Space Nuts, and thanks to Hugh in the studio who's basically stitched us all together. He, he found some string on Mars to tie it all up for us today, which was good. I knew someone had put it there. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company and we'll uh, join you again on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC.